stockbox. Annyeong! Welcome to Delightful! At last, another stockbox episode! The doll customizing series where we make it up as we go, little to no planning ahead of time. This is the one where you guys suggested a variety of animals and then voted on them. All of these could have been fun, but as the votes poured in, one thing became clear. Fluffy mammals are clearly the most popular choices. <laughs> Red Panda and Snow Leopard were neck and neck. I had to zoom in and look at the numbers to see who won. Red Panda it is! To the stock box! Now Red Pandas, or Lesser Pandas, are cute little critters more related to raccoons and weasels than they are to bears. So Panda is a bit misleading. They both love bamboo though. Anyway, they're small and have very round faces, so I used that as a starting point for finding a base doll. I pulled out a few contenders before narrowing it down to these two. I think the one on the left is a partially customized Enchantimals doll, but I can't be sure. The right doll is Ever After High. Both have appropriately round heads, but I'm thinking it'd be fun to create a doll of smaller stature. So I went with option one. Unfortunately, we've got to reset this doll to its bare minimum, which means cutting off the hair and wiping the face. This custom looks like it was going well, in my opinion. I wonder why the original artist stopped. It's pretty hair and long enough to be salvaged, so I tie it off into ponytails before whacking it off. That neck hole is teeny tiny and I don't got time for my usual methods, so I'm gonna be a bit hasty and extract the hair plugs through an incision in the back of the head. Wipe the face and scalp with acetone, and bam, it's ready for a fresh start. In retrospect, I should have moved right along and done clothes and hair, but no. I decided I couldn't stand the stiff, articulated body on this tiny doll. The arms only rotate up and down, and there's no knees at all. Something had to be done. Yank the doll's stiff little arms out of their sockets, and clear a path all the way through the torso using a drill. Clean up the shoulders to make them nice and rounded. Cut a gap into them like this. Drill a hole perpendicular to the gap. And then insert a small wire and hook shape. I made these out of a paper clip. Secure the ends with a spot of glue. Shoulder articulation done. I want the elbows to bend too though, so I cut a zigzag notch shape at the elbow. Or at least I tried to. This worked for Guinevere and Sakura, but maybe it's because these arms are so tiny, I kind of botched it. Fine, let's figure out a different solution then. How about whittled down popsicle stick joints instead? I set them firmly into the base of the forearm with a wire rod, then create the hinge joint necessary for the elbow. Insert the peg and add a touch of glue on either side. Eh, they came out kind of loose. I think the plastic hinges are bowing out. Can we wrap it more tightly? That kind of worked. To connect the modified arms, slip a tiny rubber band onto one shoulder hook. Take a needle and thread and feed that rubber band through the chest. Pull it out through the other armhole. Connect the other shoulder and then remove the thread. The tension inside the chest will keep the arms connected to the doll, and now you have a full ball and socket's worth of movement. I give the knees a similar alteration, but with a bean joint, meaning it's articulated on both sides. This means it's capable of a wider range of movement, which I did achieve, but... I mean, it looks terrible. <laughs> 
There's nothing stopping the legs from swinging in the completely wrong direction. The body looks like a broken puppet. Not when to give up, I bust out the air dry clay and get to work. We can at least add caps to stop the knees from bending the wrong way, and while I'm at it, I thought I'd bulk up the entire leg. They were a bit too skinny and straight for my liking. A lesser panda should be a little chubby anyway, right? I paint the clay and popsicle stick joints to match, and decided on the fly to give her a black gradient like the panda has. A layer or two of matte varnish later, and the body mods are done. I'm not proud of how they turned out though, it's not my best work. I feel like I made these alterations out of necessity, not particularly because I wanted to, and it shows. Well, let's move on. Reunite the doll's head to her body, then give the face two or so layers of Mr. Super Clear sealant. Once that's dry, the surface is prepped for a new face. Let's take another look at our inspiration. Red pandas have round, sparkly, noticeably small eyes, so I'm going to imitate that in our doll's new face. I also learned that they're native to this area of the world, what is southwestern China to Nepal and northern India. So it only seems appropriate we give our panda girl a South Asian aesthetic. Let's start with the eyes. I sketch in round shapes with a dark brown watercolor pencil. This doll's face mold is defined enough to provide good markers for placement, but not so defined as to restrict creative freedom from making up eye shapes. It's perfect! I give her rounded eyebrows as well, keeping everything cute and round themed, you know. I then draw the eye shines and pupil, and add the first touches of color in the iris and whites of the eyes. I usually leave the eye shines for last, popping them on with a bit of paint, but I felt like drawing them this time. Then I add some blushing with pastels around her cheeks, nose, and lips. This helps make the plastic look more like skin. Slowly but surely, with each new layer of sealant, I pump up the contrast and darken the lines. For younger characters like this, I prefer no or minimal eyelashes. I almost didn't give her any, but finally decided on one stylized flick at the corner. Using a touch of gouache paint and a teeny tiny brush, I paint on highlights and more saturated colors in the iris. Let's give her a bindi, and add two additional red dots on her cheeks. I want this to loosely represent the placement of stripes the panda has on its face. After a final layer of sealant, we can call the face up done. Moving on to hair. I've got a fair amount of leftover hair from other projects, a hair stock box if you will. Maybe we can use up some of these. I think these are extra hair wefts from making Irene Oxide. Starting in the back and spiraling my way up to the top, I paint on a smattering of glue, then stick on a weft. The wefts are a bit thick and the head is small, so to help them dry, I tack the hair in place with pins. I don't know how obvious it is from the footage, but um, I had an appointment I needed to get to, but I'd already started gluing the hair. So without waiting for sections to dry, I just threw it all down on the head real fast so I could get out the door. Thankfully, the pins did their job and kept everything in place while I was gone. One boil wash and trim later and the hair is good to go. Despite the rushed application, I think we can agree the hair turned out surprisingly decent. After cruising the internet for examples of Nepali fashion, I felt so inspired by the bright colors, patterns, and handcrafted aesthetic of many of the garments produced there. With the vague image of what I wanted to create floating around in my mind, I dump all of my most colorful fabric scraps out on the table. Surely we can put something together with all of this. 
I sketch up very rough patterns for a pair of loose pants and a sleeved shirt. Then cut out the pieces. I just used one pattern piece cut four times to make the pants. A simple solution, but adequate for a loose set of trousers. Making loose or flowy garments is always easier than form-fitting ones because there's literally more room for error. I embroider the hems for that charming handmade touch and use more embroidery threads to make a tie around the waist to keep them from falling down. Cute! It's the shirt that will be the statement piece. I begin by sewing the shirt together as usual. Then I turn it right side out, like usual, but decided it didn't look as cute that way. The garment rested in a more comfortable, natural looking position when it was inside out for some reason. So heck, why not let the stitching show? I'm going to keep it inside out. To get that patchwork look, I thought we could cut out little squares from a variety of colors and stitch them to the shirt. Using a small square paper pattern, I prepare the teeny tiny pieces. Maybe something like this? As for how to attach them to the shirt, I had no idea. Embroidery? Whip stitch all the edges? I decided the cleanest approach would be to turn under and hem each square individually. This had to be done by hand because I used exclusively knit fabric for some reason, and my sewing machine eats knit fabric for breakfast. <laughs> In retrospect, sewing squares together is essentially quilting, is it not? So, I'm sure I could have approached this in a much more professional and efficient way, but I didn't think to Google it in time. Apologies to any quilters out there who are understandably insulted by my lack of technique. Apparently, pom-poms made in Nepal are also a thing, so I gleefully added an assortment of cute pom-poms to my garment. I love pom-poms, but it gave the outfit an unintended clown vibe. Maybe I chose the wrong colors? I keep going back and forth on her outfit. I can't decide if I really like it or I hate it. <laughs> I'm sure the comments will let me know. I know what you're probably thinking by now. Catherine, you're losing sight of the prompt. Where's the red panda in this red panda doll? Er, sorry. I got a little carried away with the South Asian influence. I can bring this back. After sketching up another pattern, I cut out and prepare all the pieces for a furry hooded scarf with ears and pockets. This is gonna be so cute, right? Right sides together, sew the main hood slash scarf pieces at center front. Clip the curves, and put the lining and furry sides right sides together. Ideally, you would sew all the way around and turn it, but because this fur is so voluminous at this tiny doll scale, I'm only going to machine sew the front half, then turn it, and whip stitch the entire back half together by hand. This way, at least the part you see most in the front will look good. Next, hem the pockets and hand stitch them to the scarf. Once they're in place, I paint on cute gray paws in acrylics. Pin the ear lining to the furry ear, right sides together, and sew around the tip. Turn them right sides out. But before I connect the ears, I trim the fur. I still want it to look fluffy and poofy, of course, but its current length is a bit unruly. That's better. I eyeball their position and then hand stitch the ears to the hood. Sewing's done, but it could use a few more details. Claws, for starters. I cut out tiny triangles from gray fun foam and hot glue these to the ends of the paws. For a subtle color gradient, I generously apply pastels to stain the fur black at the tips of the ears and paws. I also use pastels to give this tail I made those signature rings. 
All done! Faux fur is, by its very nature, quite voluminous, so the scarf ended up looking absolutely ginormous on the doll. But I find that kind of cute for a young childlike character. As a petite person myself, I can relate to being swallowed up by clothes. <laughs> Hmm, I was ready to call her done, but now that the rest of her is so bundled up, her bare feet seem a little out of place. Those toes are probably cold. Let's make her a pair of shoes. Using that craft foam again, I cut out two lozenge-shaped soles. I sew in turn two tubes out of black knit, then whip stitch one end of the tube to the sole. Slip these on the feet, and use an embroidery thread to bind and lace them up. Those look nice and warm. I finish by adding the paw graphic to the bottom of the shoes, as well as more claws. But because the foot is molded to be up on her tippy toes, my shoes aren't behaving. They slip and slide around and look kind of strange. Uh, Okay, you know what? I did a half-assed job on the body mods anyway, I never want to see them again. So I'm just going to straight up hot glue on a foam platform to the doll's heels and even out the base of the foot. And now the shoes fit properly! And with that, another Stockbox doll has been created! Say hello to Red, the lesser panda. One thing I ended up really liking about this doll is how her introduction into the group recontextualizes the other Stockbox characters. Like, clearly there's some sort of where the wild things are vibe about this custom, right? So like, are the other dolls real monsters? And Red is the human that runs around with them playing pretend? Or perhaps the other characters are all Red's imaginary friends, dreamed up by a creative child running around in the woods. It's fun to think about how this set of characters could be interpreted. Minus the hat and tail, it's not glaringly obvious that the doll is supposed to be a red panda. I expect some of you were hoping for a more straightforward representation of the animal, but I ended up making more of a young girl wearing a red panda costume? But hey, that's the uncontrollable nature of Stockbox. I had no idea what I'd come up with either. Thank you so much for watching! That's the end of Stockbox Season 2! I know, it feels short cutting it off at only five dolls, but I've got a pretty good reason for that, which I'll let you know about soon in an upcoming video. That means no poll to vote on this time, but when Stockbox Series 3 inevitably starts up again in the future, I'll try to get the word out best I can through social media. Until then, thank you so much for watching! Stay artsy! Annyeong!